Okay, so two dimensional kinematics for today is chapter four. Um, specifically getting into projectile motion. We'll probably skip some of the checkpoints just so I can get to the projectile motion part. So you'll be okay to do that computer thing tomorrow. And by tomorrow, I mean next Monday. Uh, but we will come back to them. Okay. So starting with linear displacement, we already know that if we're dealing with displacement that's a vector, it's just it's the same thing. We just have to worry about two dimensions instead of one. And then of course you have your unit vector notation with the i, j, and k unit vectors. All right, so I'm, I am going to just skip through these just for the time being. Okay, so checkpoint one from chapter four. Uh, if a bat flies from x, y, z coordinates, negative two, four, negative three, two coordinates, uh, six, negative two, negative three, what is its displacement uh, r in unit vector notation? So basically, how do you get displacement from coordinates like that? You just subtract. So what is, uh, well, go ahead and subtract. Do our, the final minus initial. Okay, and so that's all x, y, z. So what do you put on for unit vector notation to indicate x, y? Oh, eight i. Yep. Perfect. And good that that's in meters. Is this displacement vector r parallel to one of the three coordinate planes? If so, which plane? Well, yeah, if it's in the xy plane, it is clearly parallel to that plane. Okay, average velocity, again, pretty much the same formula, displacement over time, but if our displacement you know, is a vector, we're going to use r instead of x. So really still nothing new. Okay. So you can find your velocity uh, component by taking the derivative of each component of your displacement vector. So instantaneous velocity of a particle is always tangent to the path of a particle. So I've given you this diagram here. Um, if you ended up moving from this position, from this position to this position, you know, what is your displacement vector? So just like delta x equaled, you know, the final position minus the initial position, you know, same for vectors. But these, you know, as vectors, have to treat them, you know, graphically. We've got to look at each direction. We can't just take the magnitude and necessarily subtract. So when we are dealing with subtraction like that, but it's a vector scenario, turn it into vector addition. Think of it as vector RF uh, plus vector RI, but negative vector RI. And what would that mean to a vector if I just take the negative of it? Flip it, yeah. I want the opposite direction of this. So this is RF, you know, RIs, the opposite of RIs, like this maybe. 
So this would be RF plus negative RI, and my answer would be like this, tail of the first, head of the last, which is what they've drawn in over here. So that's your displacement vector. Um, and it is tangent to the path of the particle. And if I wanted uh, like the average velocity, you can see that the velocity vector is drawn in here, again, tangent at each instant. But of course, the average velocity would be in this direction. It would be my displacement over time. Maybe. I'm asking too much. OK. Oh, there we go. So the average velocity would be in the direction of that displacement vector. OK. So checkpoint two here uh, says you have a particle in a circle. And this one's going to Zach. OK, so the figure shows a circular path taken by a particle. If the instantaneous velocity of the particle is 2 meters per second i minus 2 meters per second j, through which quadrant is the particle moving when it's traveling clockwise? So let's give a little sketch of that. And go. OK, so we have a particle that's either going like this or it's going like this. We're not really sure. We just know it's moving in that circle. But it tells you the velocity is really which way. What direction would the velocity vector be going? Left, right, up, down. What combination? Two I, right, and down. Good. Two. So your velocity vector was, you know, components of two I and negative two J. So this is your velocity vector down and to the right. Okay. So if the the uh, particle is moving clockwise. Zach, where would it make sense for its velocity to ever be down and to the right? Um, down and to the right would be the first quadrant. Exactly, right here. The tangent at this point would be exactly that, down and to the right. Okay, good. So if it's in the first quadrant, uh, that would make sense for that information. What if it's traveling counterclockwise? when would it still have this velocity? Yes. So counterclockwise will be this way. So when could it still be down to the right? It would have to be right there. At that instant, that velocity would be down to the right. OK, very good. Same for acceleration. Acceleration is still the derivative of velocity. Uh, you know, just realize if you have three different components, you'd have to find the derivative of each component. Okay, so still, same stuff we've done. We just have to worry about two directions instead of one, or occasionally three. So here's one problem. Uh, we've got the position of the particle, and this is given in vector notation with the i and j. Uh, it's given by that function. R's and meters, T's and seconds. Calculate A and the magnitude of A when T is at two seconds. And then what's the orientation of a line uh, that's tangent to the particle's path at two seconds? What is the orientation of a line tangent to the particle's path? What did we just say in the notes that's tangent to the particle's path at any instant in time? At an instant in time, it would be the what? Velocity. That was, back up, back up, back up. So at any instant, So 
since it says calculate a the acceleration, and it says this part, you know, tangent to the particle's path, you know, that means I'm going to need velocity. And I'm going to need velocity to get acceleration anyway, so let's just work with the velocity question first. And it doesn't actually ask me what is the magnitude of the average velocity or what's the magnitude of the velocity at two seconds. It just asks me the orientation of a line. So thinking about vectors, I really just need the direction of the velocity vector at two seconds. So just like we did before, if you have a position function, how do you get velocity? Do the derivative. We just have to worry about doing it twice. And we're going to keep this info separate from this info. That's one of the main key points of this chapter. Keep your x information separate. Keep your y information separate. All right, so doing derivative of 2t cubed, 6t squared, derivative of negative 5t. All right, and that's the i part. Derivative of a constant, zero. What does this negative 7t to the fourth become? Great. And that's j. And then it does specifically say at two seconds. So go ahead and plug in two seconds. Again, still keep i and j separate, though. times 28 is. Okay, I can get rid of that positive sign there. So we've got our components um, of the velocity specifically at two seconds. They're separate as i and j, so now what would I do to find the orientation of the line that's in this direction? Yeah, I'm going to have to end up doing inverse tangent, but just give it a little sketch first. So I've got 19 in the i direction. I, of course, meant x. So 19 this way and 224 down. And these would be uh, meters per second. And if you drew the triangle that way, you would do inverse tan of 224 over 19, and you would get All right, I'm just going to chop it at 85 degrees. And I'll take the uh, lazy way out and simply tack on what color direction to that. South of east. So that's really the orientation of the line tangent to the particle's path. Would be at 85 degrees south of east. It didn't ask me what the magnitude of the velocity was, so I just really needed the direction. If I wanted the full angle starting at zero degrees, I'd have to do 360 minus 85, 275. Thank you. Five. Okay, so that was one part of the question. Next, calculate um, A, calculate the acceleration. So how do you get acceleration from velocity? Derivative again. So 12t
Okay, so I did my derivative specifically at two seconds, so plug in two seconds. You guys are awesome. Less foolish. Shout it out quicker. Thank you. I got a four times eighty-four. There's a six. Okay. So to calculate a, that is an acceptable answer. That is in unit vector notation. But since they went ahead and said, "What's the magnitude?" Now, what do we need to do? Yeah, sketch it out and do Pythagorean theorem. Come on. So 24i, ooh, 336j. This will not be a very accurate sketch, but that is a. So Pythagorean theorem. Okay, yeah, since that was so much larger than the 24, it doesn't change it very much. 336.85? 0.86? And since we're here already, what would be the angle? Looks like it's pretty close to 90. Would that be the large side? 85.9? 86. Or 274. Okay. Done. Really nothing new. Just make sure you're keeping your your direction separate. You're dealing with x separately from y. All right, Wes. It's back to you. All right, and I'm not. Let's not do all of these. Let's just do number two and number three. But it says uh, here are four descriptions of the position of a hockey puck as it moves in the x-y plane. Okay, so we have all these equations. So for each description, determine whether the x and y components of the puck's acceleration are constant and whether the acceleration A is constant. So first question, if the overall acceleration of something is constant, uh, Wes, what would have to be true about the components of the acceleration? Would they be constant or non-constant? Okay. All right, well, you tell me what you got. I'm doing number two? Yep. Okay, well, for, um, for the X, it's going to be on the Y side. Exactly. And after you do that, it's still up to so it's not a constant. Well, oh, after you do it twice, okay. So we do it once, you're ahead of me. Sorry. I'm going to do it. Uh, 9t squared minus 4, and then if you do it again, you get negative 18t. Okay, so you're exactly right. You still have t involved, so it's clearly not a constant. It is dependent on time. But that was just the x component. The x component is not constant. Does that mean the y component is not constant? No. Is the y component constant? Yes. Yes. And then you would just get two, yeah. Okay. So the y component is constant, the x component is not constant, but if the x component is not constant, what would that mean about our acceleration overall? Is the overall acceleration constant or not? No. As soon as one component isn't, it isn't. You know, your x component 
okay, it's negative something, so you know, it's over here. Of course, we don't even know what that magnitude is because we don't know what the time is. And y direction, you know, so this is your a. Your overall acceleration can't be constant as long as one of the components is not constant. All right, so let's just look at three. Um, how about that one, Wes? Is the x acceleration component constant or not? It is constant. We would end up eliminating t by the time we did the second derivative. How about y? Exactly. It would actually be zero. So we would call that constant, though. So is the overall acceleration constant or not constant for that example? It is constant. All right. Good. Look at the page on the other side. 59. Tyler, back to you. Um, all right, you have the marble. A marble's position is given by that equation uh, with r's and meters, t's and seconds. What must be the units of the coefficients four and negative two uh, and three? So that's an interesting question. Kind of actually like the summer work a little bit. Um, it's a displacement vector, so you know that each component should be in meters. But if you're just looking at the first part here, actually, let's just look at the j, 3j. OK, what must be the, comp the unit associated with 3? Meters, OK. Then meters, so that's got to be 3 meters. But we've got this uh, 4. I'm going to put a u times some unit t cubed minus 2 times whatever its unit is and a t. And this whole thing, if it's a displacement, should be in what unit in the end? Meters. So this whole thing needs to end up being meters. Um, so, how in the world do we end up with meters there? We gotta at least know what t should be in. Seconds, okay. So, I don't even really care about these constants. But what would you have to be here, Tyler, to get me to just meters? Something that I'm multiplying by seconds cubed. Exactly. Which, physically, what is that? Not sure. There's your third derivative. <laughs> that would ha the coefficient of 4 would have to be in meters per second cubed so that you know, the seconds would cancel out and I'd be left with the meters that I want. Minus over here, of course, this term would also have to be in meters. So, Tyler, what would the u have to be here? Yeah, that would just be meters per second. Again, my seconds would cancel out and I'd be left with meters. And you can, of course, combine meters and meters and still have meters. And knowing how to work with units like that can be really helpful, especially if you think you've maybe forgotten exactly how an equation was set up, because you can check what units you should have for those terms. And if they cancel correctly, you would either know that you're correct or incorrect. OK, hooray, we've made it to projectile motion. OK, projectile, any object where the only acceleration is that of gravity. So of course, we'll have cannonball examples. Uh, somebody hits a tennis ball. Somebody throws a baseball. But the projectile part of that and the trajectory that we'll be considering is only when that object's in midair. Okay, so if somebody's throwing a ball, I'm talking about as soon as the person releases it, because of course their arm is providing a force on the ball, and that's providing a different acceleration than that due to gravity. And then of course we'll talk about when that projectile will probably strike the ground. Well, of course, there's going to be a force back on that ball from the ground. So I don't care about when it hits the ground. If we're, if we're ever talking about a projectile hitting the ground, it's always that instant just before it hits the ground. 
So the only force that is affecting the ball is the force of gravity. All right, and the trajectory is our path. We've talked about that already. It's going to be symmetrical. Of course, we're ignoring air again. And like I said, here's the important key to this chapter. Horizontal and vertical motion are independent. Treat them separately. And this particular problem is not a projectile question, but what do you think? If we're traveling uh, across the river, like south to north, either boat's going up. But this boat has a current that it's got to deal with. Four meters per second, left, west. There's no current there. Which boat crosses the river first? Who thinks this one? Who thinks this one? Who thinks they're the same? They are the same. So you got to listen specifically as to what the question is asking. It's saying, which boat crosses the river, goes across the river? So that's the direction I'm asking you a question about. I do not care about any velocity that would be perpendicular to that because this four meters per second has no component that's north or south. It's purely west. How fast is this boat going across the river? Well, specifically across, it's going at five meters per second. How about here? Five meters per second. So it would be the same. Now, which boat has greater net speed? Greater net velocity? Yeah, definitely left because you know, we could add our vectors head to tail and we would have a, you know, a greater hypotenuse than five. But it's almost like wasted velocity because it's not helping me go across, it's just helping me kind of drift downstream. The question was, which one goes across first? So that's similar to projectile motion. So you write the same. So what do we call vertical acceleration? Starts with a G. Okay. Does it affect vertical motion? Sure. It, if things are falling, it's going to make them fall faster and faster and faster. If something's thrown up, it's going to slow it down. Does gravity affect horizontal motion? No. Nope. It does not affect horizontal motion at all. Um, you could imagine, let's say I, I was bowling, okay, long, infinite bowling alley, no friction, no friction, no air, I bowl to strike, aiming at the pins, dead straight, of course it's infinitely long. Uh, will the bowling ball speed up because of gravity? No, why would it? Gravity's just trying to pull it down. Would it slow down because of gravity? No. Is it going to speed up on its own at all? No, there is no such thing. There's no horizontal gravity. There's no natural horizontal acceleration. Of course, without friction and air resistance. Um, so gravity has nothing to do with our horizontal motion. So when we're dealing with projectile problems, we've got to kind of keep our horizontal motion stuff separate and our vertical motion stuff separate. So when we're dealing with the horizontal direction in a projectile motion problem, our very basic displacement over time formula is the only formula that applies. I would never use the kinematics in the horizontal direction because there is no natural horizontal acceleration. Kinematics only work when there's acceleration. Or you could just write, you know, displacement over time. Okay, so this is 
These are two falling balls, marbles. Uh, one is given a horizontal velocity. It's given some kick out to the right. But how do their fall heights compare? They're the same. It didn't matter that this one has some horizontal motion as well. Sure, it clearly has some horizontal velocity, which is why it's going to the right. And it will forever be moving to the right until it's the ground. But the vertical information is the same. OK, 62 uh, says a ball is hit to the outfield during its flight, ignoring the effects of air. What happens to its A, horizontal, and B, vertical components of velocity? Marcel, let's start with horizontal. You launch a projectile into the air. What happens to its horizontal component of velocity? Speeding up? Sideways? No. It's not speeding up horizontally. There's no horizontal acceleration. So horizontal, remember, always stay the same. How about vertically, though? As soon as it's launched into the air. Yeah. Marcel, what happens to the vertical component of velocity as soon as it goes, leaves your hand and it's going up? So as you let go, it's going faster and faster up. Think of the whole thing. It's slowing down as it's going up. And then what's its vertical component at the peak? Zero. And then after the peak, what happens to the vertical component? You're switching it. It increases. Slowing down, going up. Stops vertically for a second. Well, you know, instant. And then uh, speeds up going down. So I think we answered one of these other questions. OK, well, that was about velocity. All right, Marcella, how about the horizontal and vertical components of acceleration? Quasi-trick question. So tell me about the horizontal component of the acceleration. What did you just say about its velocity? It's constant, and specifically what? Was it speeding up sideways? So what's the acceleration sideways? If it's not speeding up or slowing down, it's not accelerating. So zero. OK. So the horizontal component of acceleration, it's just kind of a trick question. There isn't any. It's not speeding up left or right. You know, you go bowling. It's not like as soon as you release the bowling ball, it just starts speeding up at the pin. No, there's no horizontal gravity. Well, I'll leave, I'll leave that. <laughs> we'll get into universal gravitation, but um, how about the vertical components of its acceleration? How so? Don't answer the same question again. This is a trick question, sort of. It wants you to answer the same question you just answered, saying that, oh, the velocity decreases as it goes up, and then it increases as it goes down, or the speed does. But the acceleration is just the rate at which it speeds up or slows down. And what is our value for, for gravity that we're using? Uh, negative 9.81. Does it matter where the ball is? Is it like negative 9.82 somewhere else? Negative no, we're always using negative 9.81. So the vertical component of acceleration is constant at negative 9.81. It doesn't matter where the ball is. But that is a common trick question. Don't accidentally think they're asking about velocity. If I ask you what the acceleration is of this projectile going up, it's negative 9.81. What's the acceleration when it's going down? Negative 9.81. Sure, velocity is changing, but don't misread that. OK, so that's you know, at any point. Going up, peak, going down, acceleration would be negative 9.81 meters per second squared. OK, so here is the basic trajectory. And I want to draw um, gravity vector and my velocity vector and the components of that. So 
Just imagine a ball was thrown from this position through the air, hits the ground over there. So at these indicated spots on the trajectory, I want to label these vectors. So what would a gravity vector look like here? Straight down. What would the gravity vector look like right here? Any difference in size? Nope, same magnitude. Still 9.81, straight down. And at every spot, 9.81, straight down. All right, I'll do the velocity in black. Now, what would the velocity vector look like here? You threw the ball, it's going that way. Okay, meaning up, straight up? Yeah, it's up and right, it's tangent to the path. So, something like that. How would the velocity vector look different at the next spot? Or would it look the same? Yeah, it looks flattening out now. Gravity is decreasing the vertical component. How about right at the peak? Is there no velocity right at the peak? More specific, there's no what velocity at the peak? Okay, there's no, you say no positive velocity, just be a little more specific. There's no upward velocity, there's no more vertical velocity. Does that mean the ball is totally stopped? No. And when we were studying trajectories before, it was straight up and straight down. So this is a little different. Now we've got some horizontal velocity. So that does not go away. There is still some horizontal velocity to the right. Correct, there's no longer any vertical velocity. And then sort of the mirror image, but downward on this side. Again, trying to imagine these are all tangent lines to the path at all those spots. What happens to the vertical speed of the ball as it goes up? Slows down. What happens to the vertical speed of the ball as it falls down? Speeds up. So my vertical components, and I'm going to leave a space because I'm going to draw in the, uh, well, let me do that first. Vertical component gets smaller than larger. The horizontal component, and I'm going to draw it, I'm going to draw these as little triangles, as components of all the black vectors, the velocity vectors. The horizontal component never changes, it's always the same size. Don't make it any bigger, smaller at different places. So to the best of my ability, all those red vectors are the exact same magnitude. And the vertical one starts out pretty big, but starts to get smaller, then is nothing, then gets bigger again, but going down. And then you fill in the, uh, the stuff we know, which is all that we just said.
You get some water if you need to. stealthy. Okay, so here's the, the heads up as to what's kind of coming. When we're dealing with velocity problems, you will often be given like the initial launch speed of some ball, like, you know, it was thrown at 50 miles per hour at an angle of 30 degrees. Remember when we talked about components of vectors, I can either deal with the velocity vector, maybe, I can either deal with this velocity vector at 30 degrees or I can deal with Vx and Vy, the components, because these two add up to the same thing. But you would never deal with all three. You're either going to deal with just the components or if for some reason you needed to, that initial velocity at that angle. But once you break it into components, you're pretty much done with the initial velocity. I no longer care what that was. I just need the angle to get the components. All right, so our equations that we're using, nothing new. In the horizontal direction, there's no accelerations, there's no kinematics, there's no horizontal gravity, just displacement over time. But for any vertical information, of course, I have all the kinematics. And like I just drew it, um, I don't know, I, I almost always draw my projectiles from left to right. Of course, it's mirror image wouldn't matter. Um, and I almost always draw the X component first. And we would label the X component VX. But we don't need to put the VX naught. Why do we label the initial y velocity with a little knot, with a zero, but not for the x. Because x never changes. x not is x, is x final. It never changes. So the vertical component would change. No? Okay, I guess I have to write that in myself. but the x doesn't. So just like the triangle we drew a second ago, velocity, my original velocity is my hypotenuse at some certain angle, and I want to make the components out of it. Well, x is what, the adjacent side or opposite side? Adjacent, so that's going to be what function? To find the vx on the bottom here. Yeah, if I knew the hypotenuse and I know the angle and I want Vx, it would be cosine. So it would be the original velocity, you know, at whatever angle times cosine of that angle. And of course, uh, the initial vertical velocity would be sine. V naught times sine of the angle. Oh, and I'm missing my, sorry, here's the fifth one. All the same stuff. 
And we just specifically stuck Y's on all of these to try to help keep track of our directions. Okay. Do you guys have to write that? No. Oh. <laughs> well then. All right, a couple quick graphs. What would the horizontal, and think of the trajectory we just drew. We just drew all the horizontal over time. They were the same. So whatever your horizontal velocity is, it's not changing. Come on, pen. There we go. So just be some consistent graph at whatever Vx is. What about the graph for the vertical component of velocity? For a ball that you just threw up in the air, came back down. Yes. It starts positive. So this is my maximum positive velocity, but as soon as I as soon as that ball leaves my hand, it is slowing down. It will stop going up for an instant at the peak and then it's going to go back down. So its velocity will be negative. And then it's speeding up, going faster and faster and faster as it goes down. And the slope should equal very good, negative 9.81. Is that written? OK, um, I'm going to go over three classical problems somewhat quickly. We'll come back and go over these a little bit later. Uh, especially because I have a little device that kind of mimics this. I found this clip art, I'm sorry. It was the best I could do to try to mimic what I was going for here. But it says your friend, this Mafia Hitman here, uh, and this is you, the flapper, I don't know. Your friend fires a gun horizontally. At the instant he pulls the trigger, you drop a bullet from the same height. Which bullet will hit the ground first? Ignoring friction and air resistance. That's what, that's the common answer. Um, but at the same time, your friend did not fire his gun up or down. So vertically, they have the same exact information. The initial vertical velocity was zero. So the fall time should actually be the same for either bullet. Now, of course, you've got a projectile traveling through the air like this. You know, you're going to have a little bit of a lift force with the air. So it's not exactly true in real life, but if we were able to take out the air, it would be. All right, the shoot the monkey. I did not make this up. This is a classical physics problem. And I have a little video I'll show you another day on this. But the, part, the problem is you are aiming your gun at a monkey that's hanging from a branch, as so. At the instant you pull the trigger, you startle the monkey and it drops from the tree. Will you hit the monkey, miss above, or miss below? What if you, what if the monkey didn't fall? No matter, and let's, I'm going to come back to this one. Close your eyes. Okay. And we can skip over to classical problem number three before we do the monkey one. A hunter, also your friend, aims directly at a deer. Such a cute deer, too. And he's got this you know, laser guided sight. Bam, right there. Where will he hit the, the deer? Right there? The, the bullet's going to go up. <laughs> no matter how powerful his gun, how fast that bullet travels. 
that leaves the gun. Now, if it's traveling very fast horizontally, that would be you know, maybe not even noticeable. But it's going to hit somewhere below where he aims. Well, I'm trying to draw my. Yeah, he's going to get the foot. Okay. A pretty weak gun, actually. Just throw the gun at the deer. So he's going to get the foot. Maybe that would have been better. And, like, really, you know, far away, like, sniper rifles, they have sights that compensate for how far you are away. So that's a way of getting around it. But wherever you aim, it's going to fall a little bit. So back to the shoot the monkey, if the monkey didn't drop, you were probably not going to hit him. Or you're obviously at least going to hit below where you're aiming because that because gravity is immediately pulling down on your bullet. But if he actually drops when you fire the trigger, he'll, he'll almost like fall into the bullet. So that's actually your only way to hit the monkey. All right, I'll, I'll show you a little more on that next time. We've got to do at least one example problem. So stay with me till the bell rings, but we've got to make it through the Alaskan rescue plane. OK, first, I do understand if this plane can travel here, why wouldn't it just land and save the people? I don't know. But it is dropping a package of emergency rations to a stranded party of explorers. The plane's traveling horizontally at 40 meters per second, and it's 100 meters above the ground. Where does the package strike the ground relative to the point at which it was released? Where does the package strike the ground? So this is a horizontal question relative to the point at which it was released. So if it's released here, it obviously doesn't fall straight down if it was originally in the plane moving at 40 meters per second. It's going to have this sort of half trajectory. So this whole distance here is what we're looking for. OK, you guys have the numbers. Give myself some space. When you're dealing with a projectile problem, list the information that's given separately. X, horizontal stuff, separate from Y. And I even make a little chart. What information do I know that is specifically horizontal information? OK, the initial velocity, which is the velocity in the x direction, is 40 meters per second. That will never change. Anything else? In the X? Right before it hits the ground. OK, so we can't deal with when it hits the ground, because that's a whole other force. Gravity is not the only thing acting on anymore. Um, we do also just know that that was our question. Our question was horizontal. What is uh, delta x? And you wrote this in your notes. What's the only formula that helps you with the horizontal direction? Aha. That is the only thing I can use to solve for delta x. I've got to use this formula because there's no acceleration present horizontally. It's the only one that makes sense to use. I've got the velocity, but what piece of information am I obviously missing? Time. And time is not a vector. I can use time in either direction. And that's pretty much how you relate the two. And most of these problems, you're going to probably be solving for time from one direction and use that time to get information in the other direction. So vertically, information that I know would be what? Delta y is equal to a little more specific. Good, it's going down. We've got to make sure we keep track of our negative signs. What else? Good, gravity. Our acceleration is gravity. So again, make sure we use our negative sign. One more thing. 
This is sort of a half trajectory, so it's kind of like the peak. What was true about the... Good. The initial y velocity is zero. So this is kind of nice because I, I didn't have to do any trig. If I'm starting up here, we won't be able to avoid that in all the problems. And like I just said, my goal is to find the time. If I can find the fall time, that's the same amount of time it's going out to the right. So simply look at your variables. What kinematic has all that stuff in it? All right, calculator people, I need you to be quick. Okay, of course this is zero, so that's nice, that goes away. And we've got to kind of move that around because trying to find t, you're going to end up square rooting something. 4.51 seconds. Anybody else get that? Okay, I need a third party. <laughs> Going 4.51. Okay. So take that answer and apply it to your x direction. So I've got my 40 equals x over 4.51. Forty times four point five one. What? Okay. Don't pack up just yet. Okay. So this is another projectile problem. It's not really a full projectile. It's not starting at the same height that we're finishing at. Uh, but it says a stone is thrown from. Uh, the top of a building upward at an angle of 30 degrees uh, to the horizontal with an initial speed of 20 meters per second. If the height of the building is 45 meters, how long before the stone hits the ground? And what is its speed just before it hits the ground? Okay, I'm going to erase all of this. So projectile problem, I want to, of course, list my horizontal and vertical information separately. And unlike the uh, plane dropping off the supplies to the stranded people, there is a vertical component of my initial velocity here. So this is my initial velocity. And if I'm given an angle, unless it's actually asking you the range, if I'm giving you an angle, go ahead and find the components of the initial velocity here. Go ahead and find Vx and that initial y velocity. Knowing that is simply just sine and cosine. So drawing your triangle the way I drew it, vertical will be sine, so you do 20 sine of 30. And does anybody have a calculator? Oh, and there's our lovely 30, 60, 90 triangle. So we should have known that already. Opposite the 30 is always half the hypotenuse. OK. So that's my 1, 2, square root of 3. So that should be 10 square root of 3 if you knew your triangles. But what is it as a decimal? 17.7. 7, OK. Okay, so good start. This is in meters per second. Mm -hmm. It is right, it is up, so they're both positive. Um, the actual question was for time, so we'll see which direction will be helpful here. Um, and probably not the x direction because I don't know what this is. If I did, then I could just, I could avoid kinematics altogether and I could use just my x information to solve for time. 
but I don't know that. So I got to keep listing some Y information. Um, I'll just help, just lo help me list the last two pieces of information I'll need. Acceleration will be. Good, and very important we make that negative. It is going down. And then we find an equation that has all that helpful stuff in it, which for some reason often does seem to be this one. And that would at least help us with the first part of the problem. That would help us solve for time, but it's very important you plug in this 10. Like, don't go back and plug in the 20. You want just vertical info. OK, we'll do that again later. I think we are stuck with our uh, quadratic. Yeah. yeah, ideally, you don't want to use this one if this term goes away. Often, V0 would be 0 if it's like a half projectile problem. But unfortunately, it isn't for us. So we, this is a good one to practice. We either need to know the kinematic equation, I'm sorry, the uh, quadratic equation, or we need to know how to use it on our calculator, ideally both. Um, but let me just plug in and we kind of rearrange and look at it the way we would as a quadratic. So when you typically use a quadratic equation, you've kind of set one side equal to zero. And so if you are plugging in on your calculator, you should have a little function or a way to do that. And I think it just asks you, I forget my squared, like what term A is, what B is, and what C is. So those, so it, you know, A is whatever constant you have before the variable that's squared. B is whatever you have before just the variable, and then C is sort of your constant added on to the end. Yeah, so do you guys know how to do that? Can we teach each other how to do that on a calculator? So which answer is not the answer we're looking for? Okay, so we're definitely not looking for a negative time, so use your common sense to eliminate that answer. Uh, but I guess it's the way you can do it on your TI calculators. You could also just, I believe, just type in the whole equation if you've got a solver program. Yeah. So, Daniel, I'm not sure what's going on with yours. We can look at yours a little later. Maybe you just, maybe I put it in wrong. But it should give you two possible answers. Anyway, it is good practice to use a quadratic. You might come up with it. Now, if you're Brandon and you're a holdout for the TI-89 graphing calculator, uh, let's, hold on, give myself a little more space. What is the quadratic equation? <laughs> a little smaller. Okay, so you, if you remember that, and you guys should hopefully remember that. Did you sing a little song, remember that, back in the day? This is where you'll get two different answers. You have plus or minus. Um, and just like you would enter in your calculator, the ABC, you know, that's where you're getting the A, B, and C. And you can type that into the equation. Okay. So however you want to do it, the answer you should get is 4.2 seconds. Okay. The last question that I asked, though, was what is the speed as it hits the ground? Again, as it hits the ground, not after it's hit the ground. Don't just throw out zero as your answer. It would not be that easy. Um, but you got to realize you have components. Okay, so we know our x component is not changing. That should still be the 17.32, but we do want to find this final y component, uh, sort of like we did in that homework. So I'm going to clear out this mess. And again, technically we could use the time as 4.2 
two seconds if we wanted to, but just in case we made a mistake there, let's try to not use that piece of information. So without using time, that left us with the last kinematic, the squared one. Okay, again, important, we're remembering our negative signs. If you forgot to make that 45 negative, you know, then you're going to end up with this term being negative, and that will mess up your answer. Now, what you do need to remember, though, is that if you're square rooting to get your final answer, Vy, you know, that could have been positive or negative. Obviously, it should be negative since it's going down there, so you would have to add your own negative sign. Or, of course, just draw your picture with it going down. Anyone have an answer for that component, that part? I guess that's all the room I have. All right, 31.35 meters per second is that component. We've made a nice little triangle of our velocity components as it hits the ground. Do your Pythagorean theorem for those last two values. And you get an answer of? Negative. Just give me the hypotenuse. Okay. Just the hypotenuse. And did it say speed or velocity? Speed. Okay. Again, if it just asks for the final speed, we can stop there. We don't need to find the angle. If it asks for the final velocity, you would need magnitude and direction for your answer. All right, the, the range equation, you know, theoretically you could derive with the kinematic, so it's not necessarily something you're supposed to memorize, but I'm going to make you because it just makes your life so much easier. But I will show you where it comes from. Uh, now, first of all, like, what is the range of a projectile, you know, what does that even mean? You know, if you are imagining this trajectory, something is launched there, what physically is the range? Horizontal. Horizontal, change in x, exactly. This, this is the r. That's what I'm trying to find. So if you're trying to find the range of a projectile, you know, you will likely be given information such as its initial velocity and the angle at which it was fired. So it's sort of a shortcut because you don't need to find the components to do the range equation. You just need to know whatever that initial velocity was and the angle at which it was fired. So that is a common mistake I see, though. If you're using the range equation, you actually do use the original magnitude. Don't find a component and throw it in there. Use that original magnitude here. All right, so we're trying to prove this equation using what we know about projectiles. Um, and this trig identity. Do you remember that trig identity? Ever seen that before? Okay, you've maybe learned it at some point. But two times the sine of an angle times cosine of that same angle is the same thing as sine of double the angle. So we'll come back and use that. But so here's our projectile. Here. The only information we're given is what I just said. That initial speed and the initial angle. Of course, that angle, there's another thing I see sometimes, projectile motion. You're given an angle, you're given this initial launch speed. <coughs> Maybe you're asked something about the peak. You can't just try to make like a triangle out of that. If you know like the range, so you get maybe half the range and just make it. No, that angle immediately starts to change. It's immediately going to fall. Uh, so that's only the launch angle. All right, but in our x direction, this is how we set up projectile motion stuff. Keep your x info separate from your y info. Horizontal stuff is not related to vertical stuff. And specifically, what would be my x velocity here? 
my x component of this velocity, just using those variables. V naught more. How do I make this component of it? Relative to this angle, it will be what? Sine or cosine? Cosine. Cosine. OK, so Vx is equal to the hypotenuse V0 times cosine of that angle. OK, the displacement x that we are concerned about is this entire range. So all of this is r. That's what we're trying to prove, though. Okay, And the time it takes to go from beginning to end, to go from this starting point to the, infi- the entire range, we don't know either. <laughs> we're just going to call it t. But t is the only variable that we're dealing with that's not a vector that pertains to both sides here. So in this same time t, what is happening vertically? What is my initial vertical velocity? That would be sine, good. V naught sine of the angle. What else do I know? That we always can use the vertical dimension projectiles. Acceleration. And since we're just answering this in terms of variables, we're just going to leave it as negative g. And now I would really like some other piece of information over here. I'm talking about this full time. And technically, what is the delta y between here and here? Zero. I could list that. I'll go ahead and list that. It's not going to end up being helpful. But it's true. Um, And the last really piece of information we could use in a kinematic would be the final velocity. So now we just have to use our common sense. This is not after it hits the ground. It's just as it's hitting the ground, that instant before it hits the ground. What would the velocity be? Symmetrical, but what did you say? But negative. It'd be the same speed I have here, but negative. Because of course it's going down. Okay, so our goal is to relate these two through time. So I need two equations for each side. Uh, that pertain to time. And what did I always tell you we're supposed to use in the x direction? Ah, that was an important one. Good. Velocity is displacement over time. That's it. There's no acceleration, so there's no need to use the kinematics over here. And I'm just going to rearrange and solve for t. Do we need to put like the yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rearrange solve for t, and I will plug in. For x, I'm going to plug in r. So swapping that. For v, I'm plugging in v naught cosine theta. Okay, same thing for the y direction. I need an equation that's got time involved because that's how I'm going to relate these. Uh, and I kind of gave you the hint that this is not going to be helpful. So what equation has one, two, three, four, those, those terms in it? No, because you got the y. Oh. But that equals displacement, right? The one half. Displacement equals one half. Initial plus final times time. Uh, okay, try again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is the first one. Final velocity equals initial plus a t. Okay, but plugging in our stuff, we've got negative. 
I never leave myself enough room. <coughs> Minus G times T. And very important, we have this negative sign here because these don't just cancel out. Yes, we have negative two. So now we just clean up. Now we just stick them equal to each other because they both equal t. And you can go ahead and simplify. I will do the same thing. And of course, we were trying to solve for r, so leave r on the left hand side. So we've got two. We have a v naught times a v naught. And then we have our cosine and our sine. kind of highlighted in blue, that's the trig identity we wanted to use, which is equivalent to sine of double the angle. So that's your range equation. So you're still using your original speed and the you know original angle you no but wasn't it fun to go through it <laughs> um, now one of the questions that was on the web quest and comes up from time to time is at what angle would you maximize the range of a projectile I mean obviously you don't want to shoot it at 89 degrees because that's going to come pretty much right down at your feet. You obviously don't want to shoot it at one degree. Yes, 45 is the answer. If you are asked to explain why, you would refer to your range equation, which is based off of the sine function. What does the sine function look like? So there's my sine function. Where is the maximum value of the sine function? Think you, th using this as like 360, I know you guys do in radians, but let's call this 360 degrees is the full cycle. So obviously the middle would be 180. So 90. So why would we just say 45 if it's supposed to be 90? Because we have this 2 in here. So sine is maximized at 90 degrees, but you would be doing sine of 90 degrees when your angle is 45. 